morning illuminates the dense jungle. Herons and peacocks emerge from the shadows and shake off the night. A gossamer mist rises from the lakes and ponds. Then suddenly in the distance, a roar booms out. The sound rumbles deep and resonant like an earthquake threatening to burst through the ground. Water buffalo and sambar deer raise their heads and stare. Then silence. Nature's last great sentinel, a 500 pound Bengal tiger, has moved on. Their beauty, power, and grace is unrivaled. Simply being in the presence of a big cat can be a life transforming experience. What you're about to see, you will not see anywhere else on earth. Tigers running full speed directly below your feet. It takes a company like National Geographic many years in the field to capture the footage that you're about to witness. And when that whistle blows, that tiger will be loose. Just cleaning up the sink, getting ready to go out and see the animal. Gotta get this stuff cleaned up first. Get the human family going, get the ape family going, get all the pieces in order. There's always a hundred things to do, and if I get 71 of them finished, I've had a good day. So it's a it's fairly common to get comments from very well-meaning people to say that these animals only belong in the wild, right? And if this was an idealistic world, I could see how you could make that argument. But unfortunately, this is not a perfect world, right? We all know this. Uh, if we take tigers, for instance, I am happy when someone says, those tigers don't belong in a zoo, they belong in the wild. I'm happy to pull up a global map and say, point to me on this map, where you think they belong. That there's no place that doesn't have massive human impact already. The wild of Africa and Asia is at its wit's end. It is so small and under such enormous pressure, all that's left are oceans of people surrounding tiny islands of wildlife habitat. The wild itself may very well completely disappear in our lifetimes. Welcome to Tigers, the Institute of Greatly Endangered and Rare Species. From tiny newborn cubs to full-grown 700-pound big cats, they are trained by professional handlers who have dedicated their lives to working with these exotic animals. Wild animals did not make good pets. You'll also get to see and learn about these animals from their handlers in our wildlife shows. You'll see animals up close having fun, playing with their handlers, and performing natural behavior, not circus-type oh, tricks. Are trying to create a place where people can come and learn about exotic animals in a new and completely different way. Good boy, this is Inca, one-year-old jaguar. Often, when we make a tiger commercial, it only requires one tiger to be in the scene. If these animals can live here with us at Tigers and become our friends, hopefully we can help them survive in the wild. We're starting. Just not against the windows. We want to have a little pathway there. <laughs> Good morning! Good morning! Welcome to Tigers. This is the Institute of Greatly Endangered and Rare Species. Once again, my name is Sarah, and this is Safari Mari. Hello! <laughs> oh, you want me to do the tour thing again? Yeah, when you come on the day safari, you're going to get to see the world's largest big cat, the liger. 
We're also going to put tiger cubs and wolf puppies in your lap. Full grown tigers are going to run beneath your feet and they swim with their human trainers. And also we have monkeys, chimps, eagles, and the elephant. See you there. And look at the camera. That's what you'll get when you call. <laughs> <laughs> that is what you get when you call. <laughs> The Wild Encounters Tour is an amazing hands-on experience. It's a walk-through safari of our 50-acre nature preserve where every animal that you meet is up close and uncaged. You know, the big beginning of the tour comes out and you see this massive liger. Like, what is a liger? You know, half lion, half tiger, only heard of Napoleon Dynamite. I know, it's kind of old, 20 years ago, but... And then there it is. My baby, <laughs> the liger, who is an incredible creature who I absolutely adore. You get to see him and you get to see him in his size and his glory and his majesty and his, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. Please do not sit, stand, or lean on the benches. Please do not pick any little ones up as we are not accepting donations for food at this time. So that's how you start. So how can you get any cooler than that? Well, people turn the corner and then the next thing they see is a cheetah. And there's a real life cheetah in front of you. Like, whoa. When people think of a cheetah, everyone knows it's the world's fastest land mammal, right? Even a five-year-old probably knows that. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting to see him just sitting there and purring with me because the world's fastest land mammal is very energy efficient. Yeah. <clears throat> You're a good boy. So I, I got him when he was somewhere around six months old. I've hand fed the cheetahs every single bite of food that they've ever gotten in their whole life. And I'm a part of their coalition, I'm their friend. I'm always there to help them and to protect them and, and to make sure that they are thoroughly entertained and they have the best life possible. And I had no idea. It's got to be one of the coolest animals on the planet. Lean, lithe, and agile, the cheetah is built for speed. A spotted cat with the body of a greyhound and the fastest mammal on earth. Every facet of his anatomy is home to serve only one purpose, the chase. Cub Circle is an incredible habitat that we've set up. It's all made of cypress. The guests come and sit down in there and we bring the cubs out to interact with them. Every tiger you meet in here today is gonna be a Bengal tiger. Now when Bengal tigers are born, they are small enough to fit in the palm of your hand. People, kids especially, is one of my favorite things, is to watch these eyes light up on these little kids and watch them just, I don't even know, feel the magic. A lot of people have a moment when they're with tiger cubs and it's almost like a religious experience to have those tiger cubs running across your lap, looking into your eyes, and knowing that this animal, when it gets bigger, could possibly kill you because it's one of those wild, untamed, king of the jungle moments. So three days a week, 20 minutes at a time, cubs come out, interact, and are with the people. You're not stopping their forward momentum. You're not necessarily carrying them around, but they're interacting with you. They're crawling on you. You're making that incredible direct eye contact. You get the sight, the smell, the feel of those amazing cubs, and it helps you to understand them and make a connection with them that just simply can't happen if they're over somewhere in a cage. And then after that, you're like, oh, how can it get better than this? And then boom, full grown tigers running at full speed in front of you. It is a sight that can't be seen anywhere else in the world. It might take an explorer from a nature company decades to ever see one tiger run. Every tour, we're able to get out three or four of them and have them run, really run at full speed, 40 miles an hour plus charging across the yard to the point their amazing soft padded feet hitting the earth sounds like the drumming of a horse's hoofs. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, guys. This is my little girl, Bubbles. To watch Doc with the elephant and the interaction with this big creature that is so smart. She has everyone's number. She knows everything that's going on. And she is so loving and sweet to the guests and lets them hug her. And she loves it. She loves that interaction with them. She really Good feeds off job. it. And then all the monkeys that everyone gets to meet from the chimpanzee babies to the gibbons to the lemurs. And then you get hit in the face by volleyballs with the chimpanzees and you get to eat pizza and cookies. And then all of a sudden you get to see tigers in a swimming pool. It's just, there is not a moment that you do not see people's eyes go, what the heck is this real life? All through the 80s and 90s, I was thick in the movie and television business, making over 500 movie and television jobs, massive commercials, and ads of all kinds. This is Timba and Bubbles. They're both young African elephants. We took the pieces that we'd learned from the movie and television business, from making Eddie Murphy into Dr. Doolittle, to making Jim Carrey turn into Pet Detective. What I did on Jay Leno, what I did with Howie Mandel, what I was doing with David Letterman, I started doing that live on the property here. But the new millennium's coming up, the movie business is changing, the whole process is different. The world view of conservation starts becoming really more necessary. You really can see the big picture that wildlife is in need. We came along and made the Animal Planet television series, King of the Jungle. We decked out the place. We made it have this beautiful hidden jungle encampment, produced that show, which is one of Animal Planet's number one shows of all time. Paramount here is safety, both for you and for the amazing creatures you'll be working with. And we have this gentleman right here. He's Dr. Bhagavan Anto, and he is an animal expert. And he has it worked out incredibly well, super popular. And what was left was this magnificent set of this jungle village that was here. We took that the next year and said, look, this is a place people want to visit. And we said, hey, visit the set of that incredible show. Learn about the wildlife and the conservation that's happening here. People started pouring in to see the incredible preserve here and what it was like. And so we started developing the preserve to be something that would reflect something much more about wildlife conservation and education. And so for us, that meant planting hundreds and thousands of trees and plant species. That meant excavating. That meant building new enclosures for the animals. Every year, there's some big new project that we're working on here because we do believe in reinvesting. We want to make sure that not only do the animals have an amazing place to live that's very at one with nature, we want to make sure that our guests feel that. The minute they walk onto the preserve, they can see and they can feel that they are truly at one with nature and they get to experience what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. None of this existed. The only thing that was actually in the safari yard was the pond. The pond had just been dug. I actually planted every single plant on that hill up there. Um, I helped um, put the waterfall together. It was much, I wouldn't say simpler, but it just wasn't as big or as pretty as it is now. In the early days here, it was much different than before the tour happened. Not just the buildings, because none of these buildings practically existed before the tour. Um, it was a different lifestyle. Um, we spent pretty much our lives just taking care of the animals and training the animals and living with the animals and kind of like hanging out with them all day. Every year we keep improving, we keep putting uh, effort back into making the place and refining it to make it much better than it is and we've made it just a world-renowned destination for people to come and see and meet wildlife in a way that you can't anywhere else in the world. So, 
I guess you'd call it the wizard behind the screen is Doc. He is the mastermind, if you want to call it mastermind, the, the wily coyote genius. He's, he's, he's brilliant. Um, you know, and the one thing that I know about Doc is that he's a very successful individual, right? And he's looking forward constantly of how we can make things better, how we can make things bigger, how we can make the experience better for the animals, how it can be better for the people. It is one of those things that people don't quite get. They don't, Doc, this is what Doc is. He does his tour, he lives this life, he loves his animals, and he wants you to do the same. My uncle always has these crazy ideas. He is kind of like this mad scientist. You know, all right, I got this idea, this is what we're doing, and we all go, what? But you trust the process because it's never really failed yet at all. And I guess he's been like this forever. My dad will tell you stories about just these, these crazy things that he and my uncle would get into. And my dad just trusts the process. <laughs> Granted, I think they were younger and there's probably more blood involved uh, back then. And that doesn't happen now, but um, he just is always, always two steps ahead of everybody else. But also Doc has this great innate vision that none of us have. There's not, there's not a single person on the property who has his vision. You will understand the process, but you have to like listen, but not with your ears. You just kind of got to go, all right, here we go. And this is a man that I will walk into a situation with, with massive apex predators and a African elephant and not question one bit of my safety. He, he is a unique individual who can come up with things and you're just like, no, that's not going to work and he makes it work. And sometimes he even doubts himself and he'll make like the feeding wall and he's all like, I'm gonna make this feeding wall and then he'll go, this isn't gonna work. And we're like, no, no, I believe you now. We produced the amazing Wild Encounters Tour, the day safari, for about 15 years. We had a lot of people come back a dozen times, having such a great time engaging with us in so many ways, but they really wanted to see more. We changed the tour up a little bit, but we wanted to give them something brand new, a completely alternative experience. And from that, the night safari was born. So when my uncle decided to create Night Safari, I was like, what? What, what do you, you want us to do what? More safaris at night? You're out of your mind, you're out of your mind. And he started building this massive building. Doc first started saying, I wanna build this building in the middle of this tiger habitat and people are gonna stand up here and they're gonna view the cats and then they're gonna come inside the building and get close up and feed the cats. And you're like, oh yeah, <laughs> sure, sure it's gonna work. We're, gonna get, we're just gonna make this building inside the habitat. The animals at the night safari take on a different view. They see the world different. A lot of them are really tuned in to nighttime and they feel different, they see different. The ability for you to look at them has changed in the black of night with the flicker of fire. It looks like something else. The big tigers swimming through the pools in the dark are just magnificent. Bubbles out there with just flickering light of her big fountain and the fires around her make her seem like a completely different character. And all of that combines together just to give you this amazing, relaxing vibe. Night safari's a la carte. You can come and do whatever you want. Day safari is super structured. So we tried to make them be very alternative experiences that having both would be magic. If you rather just 
hang out and you really like the people you came with because you are going to be spending a lot of time with them too, then definitely book the night safari because it's a lot more laid back scene where you can just chill with all the beautiful animals around you. Because of the techniques that my dad has been able to develop over the years and the true relationships that we have built with the animals, they have a different sense of the world around them. They're not just a tiger living inside of a 10 by 10 cage that's upset, that's frustrated, that has nowhere to go. These animals are loved and they're given so much time put into them. If you run into someone in the street or like in an airplane, if I sit next to a new stranger in an airplane, they're like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, well, I can't explain that to you exactly. You kind of have to see it to believe it. It might look easy what we do, but it's not easy. It is a lifetime of living with your animals. Like it would be a lifetime being a farmer. It's a life, it is a calling that you have. It's not just a job, it's something you're gonna give everything to. This is what I do. I wake up and take care of my animals, whether they're young or they're old. And you take care of them and they're part of your family and they're part of your life. They're part of you. You know, it's, it's one of those things that you're connected to them that strongly. Someone can't just do it. Working here at the Myrtle Beach Safari is a 24 seven job, meaning that if there's work to be done, it doesn't matter if it's six o'clock in the morning or if it's 11 o'clock at night. The animals here are in our care and they rely on us. In order to work here, you definitely have to have a sense of motivation. That's the biggest thing. Being self-motivated is a driving force in the staff that we have here, including our family. So last night we actually had some babies born and the mom was ignoring the babies. She didn't clean them, she didn't take care of them. I left them with her for as long as I could to see if she would nurse them and she wouldn't. So I had to take them last night to make sure that they got fed and proper nutrition and that they survived because the mom just wasn't gonna take care of them. So that's who we got in here. Raising tiger cubs that mom has rejected. If she gives birth, and ignores them, we, ha we take them immediately, right? She's, we, ha we have cameras all over the property. We're watching everyone all the time, making sure that everyone is safe and happy. And if she cleans them up and refuses to feed them, then I have to take over, or China, or Rajni, or one of the other staff, and we have to feed them every two hours. That's including all through the night. And that definitely has happened multiple times in my career. These guys are brand new. They're only about 12 hours old. Um, I've been feeding them around the clock now every two hours since I pulled them, which was about 3.30, because their mom just wasn't taking care of them. Um, she cleaned the first one, but she didn't clean the other two. She just kind of neglected them and ignored them, and she wasn't allowing them to nurse. So here I am doing critical care around the clock. So I make this look easy, because I've been doing it for about 22 years now. So when new people come in, they just see how easy I'm having of it and they think that they can just walk in and feed a tiger cub or um, take care of a baby monkey but it's hard and it takes experience you know it's a, like a lifetime job of raising a child there's Tara she says good morning Tara right now is just about four months old I bottle her about every four hours she gets to eat as much as she wants She's not on solid food yet because she just grew in four teeth. She already had two on the bottom, now she grew between two and on top. And she does wake up in the middle of the night and says, feed me, feed me, feed me. I spend 24 hours a day with them, seven days a week, and I love it. And that's what I always wanted to do with my life. Good morning, Benji. Are you ready? Come on. There you go. Look at your water. Yeah. There. 
nice nostrils you have there. Would you like to look at yourself? Oh. Hmm. She got those fine toofers. Grooming. Monkey grooming. I don't need that pop, it's okay. It needs to stay where it is. What do you think? those other bananas in our shake, huh? Having people gain an understanding of how to care for wildlife and have that up close, uncaged relationship with them is a completely immersive lifestyle. It requires us to be here with them all day, every day. There are chimps in the bed. There are tigers sleeping on the floor. There are animals that are in need as the sun rises and need to be cared for until midnight that night. It never stops. Their care must go on. So as we started up the tour, Doc had this mind-blowing idea where, of something that no one has ever done before and still hasn't been able to pull off, and that is the Tiger Run. We're the only facility that I'm aware of that runs tigers full speed down the yard. And it's an incredible thing. Getting a tiger to be able to come out and run, all out run, so that he's able to use that incredible power and grace that he's got to come out and storm across the preserve where the guests can see him doing it. And it doesn't just start off with, hey, we'll just grab this tiger and bring it out. It starts off as a process. It's getting to know those tigers when they're young. It's working with those tigers all the way up. So we will take a couple of the cubs out, show them the lure and see if they want to chase it. If they don't want to, they don't have to, but most of the time they're going to chase it down or at least one of them will chase it down and the others will chase that one down and it just becomes a big dog pile. We have a lure system that we have established and built here at the Myrtle Beach Safari. The Mopalope. Now the Mopalope is a mop, a string headed mop put on the ground, attached to a super high speed lure. As that mop comes out and gets flopping and spinning along, the tigers find it amazingly tantalizing and we reel that in up to 50 miles an hour as the tigers come after it and try and make that perfect catch. This is part of their uh, natural behavior. They want to chase down and, and catch prey. Um, it's great for our animals because it gives them enrichment. It reproduces the idea of the hunt. It gives them that extreme exhaustion moment of working so hard that virtually never happens in any zoo, no matter what. The reason it works is because we've all been here for so long because we're family, we have each other's backs, we completely understand everything the tiger's saying. The reason you don't see a tiger run anywhere else on the planet is because there's nobody that's worked together this long and has each other's back and, and understands the tiger's language the same way Doc has taught all of us. Rajni's gonna string that lure all the way out. Chris is keeping it weighted down right there so it's running smooth. The lure machine is reeling out on that paracord. Well, Cody's gonna set up down there for the strike and let her get out there and get running. Cue dramatic music.
people often wonder, well, I, sh I could be able to do this. And, and Doc's had many of his competitors come here and take the Myrtle Beach Safari, but they don't have the magic, shall we say. And I could say they're not Doc, and so therefore they don't have his vision to keep changing, to keep seeing what people want. But it's not just that. We have a family environment here. It is myself and my children, their significant others, my nieces and nephews. It is my partners that have come to live here over the decades that make the place run. The family aspect contributes to why the reason it all works, but it's not just the immediate family members, it's the extended family and our other staff. We all have the same passion. We all desperately love what we're doing, and we love that the other person loves that. And so we're able to get along. And I don't know why other facilities haven't been able to duplicate it and why the turnover rate is so high at the other places. But the reason we can do what we're doing, the reason that we can walk a 900 pound Liger is because we are family and because we all have the same passion, the same desires and the same love for the animals. There is a family atmosphere here that creates bonds that make people love and trust each other to not only deal with dangerous animals and back each other up when you need to, but to also love and support each other so that they can do new and cool things, so that they feel comfortable to speak to the public, so they feel that they want the public to get the same dream that Doc has, so that it changes their minds and makes them want to conserve things. And these incredible relationships that we've created of bonds, of trust, um, makes it so that other people can actually interact with them. These same animals you wouldn't want to interact with anywhere else. The people don't put in the same time and effort or emotions even. Every animal on the property actually knows our relationships with each other, right? So it's very, very important that we have an incredible relationship with each other, that we love each other, even if we bump heads sometimes. But um, if you walk into a situation where, where we're not on the same page and that we're not on the same team, then the tiger knows that, the chimp knows that, even like a baby tiger probably picks up on it immediately. Being able to be around family all the time is, is pretty legit. And they're more forgiving and not at the same time. So it just kind of keeps you on your toes and keeps you motivated to make everybody happy. I would rather have family get my back than some stranger. And that's in dealing with tigers or just life. Gotta get the treats for the ape children. They love these little monkey yogurts. Got little monkey faces on them. Everybody wants some of those. And then everybody's gotta have some little organic fig bars. We got some blueberry, some raspberry, and some fig. Get that stuff in. And today we got a special treat. Something you don't see often. We had them donate us a bag of rambutan. Rambutan is super cool, super cool fruit. Weird looking stuff, but when you pop it open, it's got that super sweet inside, kind of like a lychee. Good stuff. All right, gonna go deliver this stuff off to the kids. That's a cool way to see the kids right there. You see starting out with little Vali and Sugriva. And my grandchildren growing up, Aiden and Aaliyah, all growing up along there. There's, there's Vali right now. Sagriva's right about there. There's Aaliyah. She made it up to there. Moksha, China, me on the wall. Time to get out. Can't forget the important ingredient. Got to have a hat for the day. And off we go. All right, good girl. Bubbles, take this. Blow, blow.
Good girl. All right. Good girl. Every breath that she takes goes in and out of that schnoz. How you breathing? How you breathing? Right, hold on to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a lovely song, Bob Bob. So Bubbles has been a part of our family since she was just about a year, maybe a year and a half old. My dad rescued her from South Africa. And when she came over here, he treated her like she was his baby. His first child is what he always tells us, that Bubbles was his first. Good afternoon, guys. This is my little girl, Bubbles. Bubbles here is a nine foot tall, 9,000 pound African elephant girl. This baby was so tiny when I met her 37 years ago that I could pick her up. She was a tiny little ivory orphan lost in Africa, nowhere to go. Knowing that there's an African elephant in the middle of everything is still one of the most flabbergasting things that goes on. Like, yeah, there's tigers and lions, but there's a whole elephant chilling here. She is in charge. She is number one in charge. Um, that is Doc's first daughter. Um, and it's still like every day you're like, wow, that's an elephant. Yeah, uh, these animals are my family. They, my tiger cubs are my children. Every single night when I'm done with them for the evening, I say, good night, mommy loves you. And then I go to sleep and they go to sleep. And I do that every single night, no matter their ages, their size. Every time I'm walking away from my animals, my tigers, my dogs, mommy loves you, good night. And then you move on because that is what it is. You know, these are my children, but this is our family. Bubbles is my cousin, <laughs> weird. Um, I have tattoos inspired by Bubbles the Elephant, so. People get to come here and not only see cool animals, but they see how animals can have cool relationships with people as well as cool relationships to themselves. When people get to get nose to nose with a tiger cub, it changes hearts and minds. It makes them look at the world differently and go, shoot, I wanna save these animals. I don't want the world to crumble and these animals not to have a part in it. So I think it's, it's very important. There is an idea held by billions of people that these individual mega charismatic creatures like tigers, like elephants, produce a kind of energy of their own, that they are in fact pressing out a thing, Shaktipa, an energizing idea, an energizing feeling. When you come in connection with it, it penetrates you. It becomes part of who you are. It uplifts you. It opens you up to a connection to the wildlife and the love of the world that often can't happen any other way. You see it in the eyes of the guests. I've seen it for 40 years. People see a tiger, they see an elephant, they touch it and they feel different for the rest of their life about that wildlife. They've had the touch of nature, the touch of God happen to them. You're never going to explain to someone why you should save a tiger unless a tiger has looked them in the eyes and chuffed. They're, they're never gonna wanna save a chimpanzee unless some, Angara hugged them to the point where they cried. At that point, they understand, right? It changes the way they feel about everything forever to make that connection with an animal that they had no idea was possible. Once that connection is made, then we can communicate with them how to help save this planet and to make sure that tigers and chimpanzees make it into the future. Murtabay Safari is a wildly entertaining show. And it's fun for the family of all ages. And it's beautiful to watch, but it's not just that. 
It's changing hearts and minds. It's making people connect with animals so that they want to conserve them. And we te teach them about conservation throughout the tour. Every step we're taking, we're trying to tell people how to conserve these animals. The tiger stands as the last great sentinel of the forest. If we lose the tiger, we will lose a piece of ourselves forever. But if we save the tiger, we could save the world. In order for the tiger to survive, it needs clean, clear skies, pristine lakes and rivers, wide open spaces, plentiful prey animals, and most importantly, the tiger needs you guys, right? People who care. Therefore, if we save the tiger, we save the world. Dr. Seuss once said, nothing's gonna change, it's just not, unless someone like you cares an awful lot. Thanks for caring, guys. Thanks for being here today. Each of the trainers, as they go and present the animal to people, and as that person's connecting, we try to tell them fun facts, but we also try to tell them how they need to conserve them. Shab is a two-month-old Snow White Bengal Tiger, and if you look at him, you see, you still see those stripes that are down there on it. A full-grown adult tiger's got a silky soft foot. Helps them be very sneaky and very, um... But does it get all callous? No, it has to stay sensitive, right? Because if they step on a leaf or a little tiny stick, they're an ambush predator. They feel that leaf, they feel that stick, they adjust the foot before they make the sound. The, the animal encounter has a much greater impact than any television show that they're going to watch. So number one, these people, they're going to care about the animals a whole lot more because they know about the animals so much more in kind of a personal way. And you have to learn about the animals to understand them. You have to understand to care about them. And then you have to care about them in order to save them. So people coming here walk away with a whole new mindset of, we really need to save these animals. You know, they're having a tough time. And these people are ready to get on board and help do that. You know, in most circumstances, the, the people that are destroying the wild are people that are desperate to feed their own families, right? So this is the problem that we're running into. And so we need to fix that. We need to, to help feed people that are living in those areas that have no other way to feed themselves except by going into a preserve that's being protected and to try to sneak through there. Angada is a huge animal ambassador for probably really every animal in the wild because he gets up and he dances and he hugs you and he looks you in the eye and he whispers sweet nothings in your ear. So when he hugs people, they just cry immediately. They think, they think of their own children, they think of their grandchildren, and that actually helps us teach people even more. A lot of people look at these animals and say, hey, they belong in the wild. They have no idea how devastated the wild is. As we told you yesterday, about one million species of animals and plants around the world are now at risk of extinction. Humans are transforming the planet's natural habitat at an unprecedented rate. The wild of Africa and Asia is at its wit's end. It is so small and under such enormous pressure, all that's left are oceans of people surrounding tiny islands of wildlife habitat. I think a lot of the public don't realize that we've taken most of the planet. We've taken everything that there is to take and we haven't left any of it to the animals because you can still turn on you know, Nat Geo or Animal Planet or something, and you can see videos where it looks like, you know, it's incredibly beautiful out there. It seems like there's still a lot happening. But some of these places are false Edens, right? They look beautiful, they look lush, but there's absolutely nothing to eat there. The wild for tigers is incredibly unstable. The Indian subcontinent holds almost two billion people. It is not half the size of the United States. Within that Indian subcontinent, there are approximately 2,000 tigers, 90% of the world's tiger population, mixed into two billion people. If you took all of the tiger preserves that exist within the Indian subcontinent, along with those two billion people, it's an area smaller than the state of Virginia. That's all tigers have left in the entire world.
they're being killed regularly because they're coming into conflict with humans. Uh, tigers are still killing people in India, so a lot of people are still killing them. And this is the biggest population of the world, right? There's nowhere else that we can just say, hey, let's put some tigers here. You know, if they naturally belong there, it's probably already overpopulated with humans. Number two, if you try and find another place to put them, you're putting them in their non-native environment and that you're putting pressure on the native animals that live there. So you are uh, forcing other animals to become endangered or extinct by putting an animal into an environment that it doesn't belong. Trying to explain that to people, that there really just isn't anything left and that we just need to protect those tiny pieces. Um, it's hard, yeah. They definitely, they definitely need to take the next step and spend a little bit of time researching it to understand it because it's mind-blowing how much is gone. Currently, there are about 3,000 wild tigers left. Unfortunately, all of these animals um, are in little individual pocket populations. So there's not more than 20 or 30 tigers in one given area. And it's one of those things that the people, they celebrate there's 3,000 tigers, the population is you know, potentially gonna go up, but no one wants to look at it from a very scientific viewpoint of if they can't freely reproduce with each other, they are what we would call functionally extinct. They still exist, but their population cannot persist without artificial help from humans, right? Because the gene pool is gonna to get too small, they're gonna become inbred. Um, some of those negative traits can pop up and those populations are much more susceptible to collapse. So um, tigers are right at the brink, not being able to exist in the wild anymore. It's a whole different viewpoint of, of changing people going, I want to help conserve animals and the environment. I don't want to be part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. There is no one right way to conserve wildlife. It will require a million arcs and a million Noahs to even consider keeping the tide back that's rushing in of the human population, which is a giant ocean pouring against tiny islands of wildlife that are just hanging on. The guests connecting with the wildlife here on the preserve creates a magical moment. We know how well it works. We know it's the great moment of change for tens of thousands of people that in turn helps us drive a message of conservation and the finances for conservation. We charged a premium price because that premium started funding the massive projects of the Rare Species Fund around the world for very specific micro conservation jobs that we knew could do very specific things to help wildlife in need in very unique areas that were in dire need of change. They come here and they change forever. Hearts, minds, wallets are open and change takes place. Millions of dollars of change saving creatures from around the world. We finally got a lot of the equipment in that we're going to be taking to Africa. Let me set this down. The first thing we need to do is uh, go through and inventory everything that's here and we're going to have to pack it up eventually because I'm going to have to carry all of this with me to Africa and then hand deliver it to the rangers out in the middle of the jungle. So for us, the thing that we find is Number one, working with the local community groups where the animals live is very, very important. You're not gonna save gorillas in the wild. You're not gonna save chimpanzees or tigers in the wild if you can't get the local people to believe that these animals have value. These are also very important, which we have to uh, show them how to use because very few of them have ever used them. These are dry bags, so it's 100% um, dry vinyl bag. In the, uh, in the field, if you take this, and you roll it twice, and clip this together, it will, it will stay waterproof. Even if this goes floating down a river, uh, whatever's inside of it's gonna stay dry. So, very important stuff to have. 
So this is just a portion of the gear that I'm taking this year to Africa with me. Um, all of this was purchased by the Rare Species Fund and the Myrtle Beach Safari to help support all of our conservation work that we do. There is a major misconception that you can just throw money at a problem and it's gonna make the problem go away. Uh, unfortunately, that's just not true. Uh, you know, sending money to a third world country is very difficult. It's probably not all gonna go where it's supposed to go. Um, but even if it did, they'd have a hard time buying a lot of the equipment, or at least for a reasonable price. Um, so we develop personal relationships with these, uh, these uh, groups, and we hand deliver them the equipment that they need out in the jungle. They're, um, you know, they're, they're really heavy duty quality there. Yeah, and they're, what do you think? You know, the, these are- out of the last decade. You know, if you, if you bought them in the store, it's probably a hundred dollar rain jacket, and we're giving probably 50 of these to the, uh, the rangers. We're not giving them cheap equipment. We want it to last, because it's gonna be a year or two before I get to back to those specific groups. Saving the people at the bottom should fix all of that. Right, because the people, the people at the top that are living in mansions are not the ones that are going to go into the wild and kill an elephant. They're asking someone who's desperate to do it and giving them just enough money to do it. Where if we could just give them a job, um, give them enough money, then they shouldn't have any desire to go out and kill that wildlife. And the easiest thing to do is make them work for the wildlife, right? The battle that we've had has been worth it because we've been able to conserve wildlife around the world. The millions of dollars that we've been able to place into conservation programs has changed the lives of the people and the wildlife in critically endangered territories. We know that rhino poaching was running rampant. They needed night vision cameras. We quickly hand delivered them into the wild. And we know in just this year, we went from 13 dead rhinos last year to only one this year. That's a gigantic change for an animal that's on the brink. That same thing has happened for tigers and for orangutans, for small animals like clouded leopards. We're out there funding people in the trenches who are changing the world's last surviving wildlife. So I've been asked multiple times, like, if I won the lottery, what would I do? It doesn't matter how much money it is, I'm gonna do this. This, this is passion. This is nothing other than passion. And the animals are actually healthier and better making contact with the public. So even if I had all the money in the world, I wouldn't shut the doors. I wouldn't say, I don't want people to show up. Um, I just think it's better for the animals and I think it's better for the world if people are able to come in and interact. I think the number one thing that keeps us all here is knowing that we're making somewhat of a difference with one person somewhere. That's it for me. If I change someone's life today because of what I do, then I have provided something for the world that I would not be able to provide anywhere else. My goal is that everyone leaves here from the Myrtle Beach Safari with a positive feeling, with a more centeredness, a closeness with nature, and a love and mutual respect for the amazing animals that we have here. I want them to take with them that we are not alone. The earth encompasses a wide variety of species and humans are the only ones that can do anything about protecting them. I think people get scared um, that they're not doing enough, right? Once, once they realize how desperate it is out there in the wild, then, then they get scared and they feel like they have to rearrange their entire lives and that they have to live a perfect life. That is absolutely not true. We need every single person to try a little bit. And I know it's so easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day life of this new fad and that new fad, but even just small ways, not saying you have to become a hermit and go live in the woods, but just small ways that you can contribute and have less waste is a way that we're all gonna be able to give back to the environment and this beautiful planet that we live on and make it a better place for all animal species. 
We hope we can continue to transform the hearts and minds of people to be able to increase our international conservation efforts that have been working so well around the world and have people come here and have the greatest smiles and the greatest joy. This is all we got. And to watch that disappear in my lifetime, just slowly but surely tapering off, will never fix what we've already done, but we have to preserve what we have left and to just give that one piece of information to that one person and watch their face go, huh, then I have succeeded in life. That's what keeps us here. The one thing I'd like people to take away from our safaris is that they should learn to see with their own eyes, hear with their own ears, and judge with their own hearts so that the world around them, no matter what it's saying, what it's throwing at you, you can see it. You can judge for yourself what's good and what's bad. Rolling, rolling, light. Are you ready? Yes. All right. So Doc, when you take a step back and look at everything you've built, what does it mean to you to have built this with your family? That, um, that's a big question. What does it mean to me and the family? We created an environment where everybody has what they need. It doesn't necessarily provide what they all want, because what you want and what you need isn't the same thing, but all of our needs are met here. All of the needs of the wildlife are put at very high end and that created for us a home base, a place where we could explore the relationship with the wildlife, but also where we could explore a relationship with the guests in that very personalized way. And more importantly, the wildlife and the guests get an experience that is vastly more enriching so that we can all take care of this incredible planet that right now is in real need of our help. The incredible opportunity to do this with my family has been fabulous. It's so cool to have the kids grow up and be part of this amazing adventure. To be with my son and have him as a child with tigers in his crib, have him wrestling around with chimpanzees and orangutans for his best friends. Cody just organically gets out there and is part of the wildlife's life. Because he had tigers in his arms from the time he was born, actually, for Cody, it's just a big flowing river that is going along where he and lions and tigers and elephants and bears are all just one. That's what we wish everyone could feel. I think it's how we felt about the world 100,000 years ago, but it's drifted away. Cody's living that Eden relationship that gives people a belief that there is a real calling card of the goodness of nature. You can feel it in the vibe of how he can work with that wildlife. And that is something so special and so spectacular. And that connection made him like no one else on earth. I hope my legacy is the family being able to maintain this beautiful preserve and to continue to give people the chance to find joy, to have that ongoing experience so that people make a connection to and have a greater appreciation for wildlife. We've done it and we hope we can continue it and that we can make that be an ongoing part of our lives.